Okay, guys, welcome back to part six of your pharmacology lecture. We're going to jump into another three drugs for you. Uh, glucose. Glucose is um, known as a carbohydrate. It's also a nutrient and a short-acting osmotic diuretic. The only one I'm holding you guys to um, for that class of drug is the carbohydrate. This is just sugar, guys. That's all it is. It's just dextose. We use this for symptomatic hypoglycemia patients. These are patients with low blood sugar levels, usually because of uh, diabetes, but anybody could just be a hypoglycemic at times. Um, you guys are hypoglycemic when you guys get hangry. If you guys do get hangry, um, that's kind of a form. You guys are you guys are hungry. Your brain's kind of starving for food. Um, and it can actually change your attitude on things. So um, kind of like those uh, sticker bar commercials, right? Um, contraindications, um, intracranial bleeds. So any kind of like head injuries that we might be suspecting. Uh, we'll talk about intracranial bleeds in neurology and uh, suspected CVA. CVA stands for cerebral vascular accidents, also known as a stroke. Um, those are kind of relative contraindications. So um, it's kind of um, provider um, choice if they want to give it to that patient or not. <clears throat> they um, uh, definitely, if your patient is symptomatic hypoglycemic, you're going to give them sugar. Uh, in order to bring back their men mental status back to ANO times four. Um, and for the oral glucose, which is what you guys carry, this, this patient cannot be unconscious. Now remember, um, it is known as oral glucose. However, we do this as a buccal administration at the basic level. That's where we are actually going to place uh, take this paste. And you guys can see the tubes there. Those are the exact same tubes that you guys are going to see on the amulets when you guys get out into the field. Um, and we take this paste, and we usually get a tongue depressor, a little wood stick, a little wood tongue depressors, and we kind of wipe it on the inside of their mouth in between their cheek and their, their, um, their gum line, and it will absorb through the mucosa of the actual um, oral pharynx itself. I'll show you a couple other tricks on that once we actually get into our pharmacology day during lab. Um, there's no drug interactions, right? It's just sugar, guys. That's all it is. Your uh, dose and administration, um, it's uh, uh, buccal, uh, 12 to 25 grams um, of paste, and you guys are able to spread it with a tongue depressor. Um, once you guys are actually using uh, glucose, we want to make sure that we are monitoring uh, the patient's BGL levels um, quite frequently while we are with them to reassess our patient. <clears throat> um, and we'll show you guys um, all that stuff uh, once we get into um, lab. Okay, uh, ibuprofen. <clears throat> um, the trade names for this is Advil or Motrin. That's what you guys usually see on the shelves of uh, your local drugstore. Okay, um, this is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or what we call an NSAID. Um, this is relatively new to the EMT basics out here in the state of New Mexico. This was just passed for you guys to use, I believe, I want to say 2018, but it might have been 2019 for you guys. Um, indications, this is um, really the only um, type of pain relief that you guys can give for our adult patients at the basic level. And it can also be used as an antipyretic for children uh, greater than six months um, and adults, right? So little kids greater than six months that have a fever um, or any adults. When we're talking about the kiddos, we usually do um, ibuprofen. Um, we wait three hours and then we'll do acetaminophen. We'll wait three hours and we'll go back to ibuprofen. And we kind of flip-flop them in order to kind of control uh, fevers um, for kiddos. Some of you guys, if you have kids, you might already know that. Um, we'll talk about that more when we get into pediatrics. <clears throat> Contraindications, there's a whole slew of them, okay? Um, and you guys, I'm not going to read these off to you. You guys do need to um, make sure that you guys know this for the pharmacology exam, all right? Um, so just make sure you guys are studying those contraindications as you're going through your, your slides here. Um, and uh, just keep a note on them because you will see that uh, on your pharmacology exam. Continuing on with ibuprofen, there are some drug interactions with this. Uh, most of them are with uh, blood, uh, blood thinners, pardon me, or uh, anticoagulants. Your aspirins, your some of the famous blood thinners are uh, Coumadin, that's also known as warfarin, 
uh, Plavix, uh, people that have some kind of uh, cardiac issue where their heart might not be pumping correctly or people that might be at risk at stroke or um, or be at risk of stroke or some other kind of clotting disorder um, could be on some kind of anticoagulant. The administration for this is uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram for the adults, um, up to 800 milligrams orally. Um, the pediatrics is the exact same. However, um, it's not to exceed 800 milligrams um, and dosing must be six hours apart. So this is where you guys that have kids or little brothers or sisters or whatever, um, this is where if you have a kiddo that's having a fever, we do um, ibuprofen first, right? And then they have six hours. And at three hours, they'll take the Tylenol or the acetaminophen. Um, three hours after that, we can switch off. So every three hours, it's ibuprofen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Tylenol, so on and so forth, okay? Um, <clears throat> with the with the special notes, um, I think the big one that we need to kind of focus on is that oncology patients should not receive ibuprofen or other NSAIDs um, due to uh, the, the risk of increased bleeding associated with these medications. Um, oncology patients, when they're doing radiation or chemotherapy, whatever they're doing, uh, that does thin the blood normally. Um, that's a wicked blood thinner, really. Um, so we want to be careful with those people. Um, we can also um, produce a fever with a toxic ingest, uh, ingestion um, with any kind of anticoagulants. If it has been a toxic in injection, uh, or I'm sorry, ingestion, um, we want to be really careful with giving ibuprofen, right? We want to make sure that this fever is due to an infection and not necessarily ingestion um, specifically with our pediatric patients. You guys can look over the rest of those um, special notes. Um, you guys really don't need to focus on those. Make sure that you guys are really focusing on those contraindications for ibuprofen. Okay, moving on to uh, ipratropium, also known as atrovent. Uh, please do not confuse this with atropine, okay? This is atrovent. Um, the class of drug is an anticholinergic. We use this in conjunction with albuterol for bronchial asthma patients. Um, what Basically what this does is we put it in the same nebulizer as the albuterol. And if you remember, the albuterol um, helps the swelling and inflammation that are around the bronchi. So it kind of dilates the bronchi. And what the ipratropium does is as, it's, as the albuterol is dilating, the ipratropium kind of forces the walls of the bronchi open. So think of it as almost like a, a fence, right? A really strong, sturdy fence. If we have an asthmatic patient and we just give them albuterol, after a while, once that albuterol wears off, the bronchi are going to start to, to uh, become inflamed again, and it's going to start closing up again, right? So we mix it, the ipratropium with the albuterol, and as we're giving the albuterol, the, the albuterol opens up those, those bronchi, and the ipratropium stents it open, just like a fence, okay? So that uh, once the albuterol wears off, uh, the swelling doesn't necessarily come back down um, or the inflammation doesn't come as fast. It's still going to come a little bit, um, but the ipratropin kind of sustains uh, the opening of the, bron uh, the bronchioles for us, the bronchi. Uh, contraindication, hypersensitivity to the drug, okay? Um, and any kind of acute treatment of bronchial spasms um, in an acute setting um, when a rapid response is required. So what does that mean? We don't want to wait to get other drugs on board before this one, okay? We don't want to get this one on first and wait on albuterol or possibly even epinephrine, right? If this is a, if we need rapid treatment, right, for our asthmatics, okay? We already talked about that silent chest, right? You can't hear anything below the patient's nipple line. They have extreme, extreme wheezes up in their upper lobes. We don't want to give ipratropium first because we want to make sure that we're giving that epinephrine first, followed by that albuterol and ipratropium mix, okay, in order to really help the body fight the inflammation that's going on in the lungs. Uh, drug interactions, there are very few um, in the pre-hospital setting. Um, I do want to make a note on the administration that we do not give this to peds. We do not give this to pediatric patients. This is only for adults. The reason why is because with the albuterol, the albuterol is a pretty aggressive medication, and kids do very well with albuterol treatments. They don't need the ipratropium as well. 
Um, so the, when it says that under the administration should be administered in conjunction with the beta agonist therapy, that's what we're talking about is the albuterol. We want to make sure that we're mixing this with the albuterol into the nebulizer in order for um, both of these to work at the same time. Um, the adult dose is 250 to 500 micrograms. You can also point that as 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 milligrams. I'll accept either one of those, whichever one you guys want to learn or memorize. And this is through a uh, nebulizer. Um, we do want to make sure that we are monitoring the vital signs during the therapy. Um, and we, again, just like with any beta agonist um, therapy, or anything that's going to kind of stimulate the actual sympathetic nervous system. Uh, we want to be careful that we, when we're using this with elderly patients with any kind of um, cardiovascular disease or hypertension, because remember, we are going to stimulate that heart to pump faster. We're going to uh, stimulate the patient to breathe a little faster. Um, and we could um, um, raise people's blood pressures because of that. So we, that's just a precaution. Um, just so that you know that when you're given this drug, these are some side effects that you guys might be seeing in your elderly patients. Okay, uh, naloxone, also known as Narcan. You guys are going to become very familiar with this drug real quick as soon as you guys hit the streets. Um, we do have a very bad opiate crisis out here in the state of New Mexico, specifically the Bernalillo County area. Um, you guys um, will find out that all of our law enforcement are carrying Narcan. Um, some of the uh, administrative people and some of the front desk people at some of our local ERs and family practice um, actually have Narcan on them at all times. And they are actually prescribing this to people that are known uh, drug users, um, specifically IV drug users, uh, as a just-in-case. So uh, this is a very common drug out here. Um, the class of drug is a narcotic antagonist. Um, so we talked about agonist and antagonist earlier on, I believe in part one of this uh, pharmacology series of lectures. The antagonist blocks the receptor site from anything. Um, so the antagonist blocks the receptor site for the receptor to, or the stimulant to um, not be able to attach that receptor site. Well, in this case, the stimulant is going to be some kind of opiate. Um, somebody shoots up with heroin, right? Somebody overdoses on oxycodones or oxycotons, right? Whatever, whether it's intentional or accidental, okay? Um, we're going to give Narcan, all right? Um, indications, um, it's the reversal of narcotic effects, um, particularly the respiratory depression part. When we're talking about somebody that overdoses on an opiate, their respiratory drive decreases significantly, um, you can run on people that might be, you know, two, four, six times a minute breathing, two, four, six times a minute. That is not sustainable with life. Okay, our normal respiratory rates anywhere between twelve and twenty breaths per minute. Um, so what we're doing is when we're giving this drug, right? We're not necessarily here to wake the patient up. Okay, um, we're not necessarily here to wake them up in a hurry. All we're trying to do is what's called titrating to respiratory effort. Okay, all we're trying to do is to get their respiratory rate up to a level that is sustainable with life, anywhere between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. Okay, your patient can still be unconscious. That's okay. All right, all we're doing is trying to get up the respiratory rate. So after you give this drug, we definitely want to make sure that we're reassessing our patient to see if we are improving the respiratory rate. All right, the other reason why we can give this drug um, is for anybody where we don't know why this patient is unconscious. Okay, or anybody possibly even with an altered mental state, okay, some kind of altermentation. I can go around in class and I can give you guys all a shot of naloxone and it's going to do absolutely nothing to you guys, okay. It's a very safe drug, all right. Um, it's not going to do any damage to you. The only thing it's going to do is it's going to increase your respiratory rate if you guys happen to be on any opiates, all right. Uh, contraindications, hypersensitivity. Again, I have heard people out there have or are um, allergic to naloxone. Um, there's studies on it all over the internet on uh, some kind of weird things that happen to people sometimes that uh, with this hypersensitivity to, to naloxone. Um, I've been told 
right, uh, numerous times by our, our um, IV drug users that they are allergic to Narcan just because it ruins their high. But um, I've never seen it. I've never seen a true hypersensitivity to uh, Narcan in all my years in EMS. Administration for adults at 0.4 all the way up to 2 milligrams. We could do that IM sub Q. Again, we are titrating to respiratory efforts and rates. We can uh, repeat this um, if needed. And if we are doing the uh, intranasal, right, if we're using the MAD device to squirt this up somebody's nose, um, we're going to draw up 2 milligrams and we're going to put in 1 milligram per each nair, okay? Um, pediatric 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Um, that's anybody um, 5 to right around 20 kilograms. I am or sub Q. Um, you guys can repeat the 0.1 mg per kg if no response. Um, please note that there are some drugs out there that will require higher doses. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about Narcan when we get into our toxicology um, lecture. I think the big thing is um, when we are giving this drug, we want to make sure that we're giving this drug nice and slow. Okay, you're going to hear the expression out there, let's slam them with Narcan, all right? We don't want to slam anything in, in, in medicine, all right? If we have somebody that's laying flat on the ground and they're breathing two or four times a minute, and we come up and we give them two milligrams right off the bat in an in a, a intramuscular subcutaneous injection, they could wake up real quick, right? And if they wake up real quick, they can vomit. And if they're laying flat and they vomit, well, that vomit's going to go up. It's going to fall back down. It's going to go into their lungs. And we just created an aspiration pneumonia for these patients. And if they die, we could be in some serious trouble. Okay? We could lose our licenses. We go to jail. All right? Um, the other thing that we could do with it, slamming people with Narcan is not healthy for them. All right? We can have somebody that is overdosed. We could slam them with Narcan. We can, we can send them into withdrawal symptoms. Okay, and sometimes the withdrawal symptoms are worse than when they were unconscious because they're breathing only two or four times a minute and they're high as a kite. All right, so we're going to talk more about that when we get to our toxicology lecture. Nice and slow. Okay, you don't have to go straight to two milligrams right off the bat unless you're doing it intranasal, and that's okay. Right, but usually when we give and I'm giving shots or I'm starting an IV on somebody, which you guys can't do, either way, we'd give 0.4 reassess. 0.4, reassess, 0.4, reassess, and we'll go all the way up to 2.0 until I can get that respiratory rate anywhere between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. Again, we will talk more about Narcan and naloxone uh, when we get into our toxicology lecture.